Um, so today we have with us Dr. Tianjing Zhao. Um, Dr. Zhao joined the Department of Animal Science in the University of Nebraska Lincoln in August as an assistant professor in theoretical quantitative genetics. She earned her Master of Science in Statistics and then her PhD in Statistical and Quantitative Genetics, both from the University um, of California, Davis. Um, in her research area, Statistical and Quantitative Genetics, she builds new models to combine conventional models um, with machine learning, and she also develops software. So thank you very much for joining us. I'll give the floor over to you now. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the nice, nice introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tianjin, and uh, today uh, it's my pleasure to present my uh, current research, uh, solving emerging challenges in statistical genetics uh, in terms of new data, large data, and uh, sharing data. Okay. Uh, uh, so here is my um, little bit of my background. I uh, I come to US for master degree in statistics after um, uh, and then I got my PhD uh, in statistical and quantitative genetics and now and then I become an assistant professor in theoretical quantitative genetics at UNL. And here is my kind of my uh, uh, pedigree and this, you may see some of the names that is familiar with you. Okay, uh, uh, so by the way, I like to uh, advertise my lab a little bit. Uh, I'm new here and I do have um, uh, fully funded PhD student positions. And uh, we will together work on the statistical and quantitative genetics projects. And for example, the neural network for multi-omics, peak, human peak functional conservation, some parallel computing and software development. If you are interested or if you know someone who is looking for PhD um, positions in, uh, in quantitative and statistical genetics, um, please, um, please help me to uh, share my um, advertisement. And I will introduce all of these projects uh, now. OK, so let's go back to my research. Um, today I will present in these three topics, new data, large data, and sharing data. And now let's look at the first one, new data, extending mixed models to multi-layer neural networks for genomic prediction, including intermediate omics data. OK, so let's see. Um, so for the new, so now let me first introduce some background of the mixed model for genomic prediction. So the mixed model has been widely used for genomic prediction to model the relationship between genotypes, see here, and the phenotypes here. And you may heard of some, heard some of the mixed models, for example, the genomic blob, G blob, and also some Bayesian uh, regression models, for example, the BSA, BSB, BSC. Um, as, as Professor Dan Ginola says, the science of genome-enabled prediction has arrived at a reasonable destination, but the voyage will continue and the new data will bring challenges. So new data, for example, nowadays, the farm consortiums and farm GTS consortiums have generated many gene expression data. And those gene expressions um, 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 formed a multi layer regulation network with the upstream genotypes and downstream phenotypes. So we can see here in the middle we have the, some intermediate omics features, such as some gene expressions. And inspired by this multi-layer regulation network, we proposed a new method to mimic this uh, framework, uh, this multi-layer regulation network. Okay, let's see how we how we do it. So we proposed a new model called NNMM, where NN stands for neural networks and MM stands for mixed models. And there are three layers in our model. The first layer, input layer, contains genotypes. 
and the middle layer contains intermediate or mixed features, for example, gene expression, and the output layer, the third layer, has phenotype. And uh, we use mixed model to model the relationships between input layer, middle layer, and also between middle layer and output layer. Uh, and also you can see here, G is an uh, activation functions in the neural network. Uh, we can also uh, assign different activation functions here to to approximate the nonlinear relationships between middle layer, between omics and phenotype. So that's how we extend the conventional mix models to a network, three layer network, such that we can include the omics between genotype and phenotype to construct this multi layer regulation network. And uh, here I just want to mention so these three layers. Those are not two separate analysis, like from first layer to the second layer, then from second layer to the third layer. So these three layers are actually connected together, and I will tell about more details later. OK, and now let's go to a very important question. Why we need these three sequential layers? For example, what app genotype, app phenotype? And when I have gene expressions, I can just treat it as as the genotype is X, then the then the omics can be can be another X, right? X1, X2. Then I can use the conventional mix model to model to include both genotype and, and omics. And the reason why we use sequential layers is because we think the omics data, the intermediate features, um uh, is also a is, is also a complex trait. For, for example, this is the expressions of of gene one, and we think part of part of the expression is controlled by genotype, and others are some residuals. And also for this one, we may think um, most of the omics is determined by the gene by the by the genome part, and and a little bit. Uh, is determined by by some environment or random uh, residuals. Um, so here in our assumption, we assume we assume the intermediate features is a complex trait. So that's why we need to we need put the intermediate omics in the middle. So we can only use the genetics part of the omics into our genomic prediction. And now let's, uh, here is just a simple demonstration on how we estimate all the unknowns in our model. So now we have genotype data, we have all mixed data, we have phenotype data. So those er errors between them are are the unknowns of our model. So we will use a single tree mix model to model um, um, uh, to to estimate unknowns between the input layer and middle layer. For example, this red part, you can see this red part is actually a single tree mix model. Now the tree is, is a first all mix. And also here is another single tree mix model for the second all mix. And here this red part is is another um, single tree mix model for the third omics. And also from between the middle layer and output layer, this is another um, single tree mix model. But here um, we allow users to assign activation functions from the neural network. Uh, here the G. So if if you think if you assume the relationship between omics and phenotype is linear, then then we can assign identity function. So which means actually we can just ignore the G here. Or if you think it is nonlinear, then we can use nonlinear functions, for example, the hyperbolic tangent function to approximate the nonlinear relationships between middle layer and output layer. Um, and here is another, actually I would say very attractive properties of NMM is that NMM allows 
um, different types of missing omics data, like missing data in the middle. For uh, here, if all the individuals have all omics data measured uh, in the middle, the data will be look like this one. But let's say my data, but let's say in my population, only some recent individuals, they are omitized. They have omics data. Sorry, they have all mixed data and other individuals, they do not have all mixed data. Then our all mixed data will be look like this one because those are missing for some individuals. And we may have uh, a more complicated scenario. Let's say some individuals, they are, they have all mixed data, let's say for, for this three, let's, for this three all mix, but other individuals have different measured all mixed data. So kind of this, this pattern. Um, so NMM allows missing omics data in the middle layer. So in the middle layer, it can be uh, values, for example, the point nine, or or it can be missing. Then how we uh, then here uh, how we infer unknowns in NMM. So here is a um, here is a specific here is a specific equations. So first, we use the MCMC sampling to estimate unknowns. Um, and you can see first at each MCMC iteration, first we will estimate the SNP effect on the intermediate features. Uh, that's this part. For, uh, we can estimate the SNP effects on the first omics, then on the second omics, on the third omics. And then step two, if we have some missing data in the middle, then we will estimate the missing intermediate omics data. And next step, if um, we were going to estimate the effect of the omics uh, on the phenotypes, this part. Okay, uh, so here I we, we have tested our method in some simulated data from other publications. So here we have uh, 1,000 individuals from 11 generations. The first 10 generations were used for training, and the last is used was used for testing. We have one one trait like in the third layer, output layer, on with heritability 0.34, which is observed for training individuals. And we have 1,200 omics features, which means 1,200 1, nodes in the middle. And we also have 15,000 SNPs, so which means uh, 15,000 SNP nodes in the first layer. Uh, so here well, we use priors in the GBLOB for all the mixed models. Um, and we use a linear activation function G. So which means which means now you can just ignore the G here. OK, so here is a typical results in our paper. Uh, so in this figure, the x-axis is the percentage of missing omics data. So let's say from 0% means all the individuals, they have omics data. And, uh, uh, and uh, here we have lar larger and larger percentage of missing omics data. And y-axis is the prediction accuracies uh, of those um, individuals in the testing data sets. So, uh, here, uh, here these red lines, solid or dashed, they they are just two scenarios, missing omics scenarios, random missing or kind of this missing of this pattern. So we can see overall, with more and more missing, the prediction accuracy will be um, uh, will be increased, uh, will be decreased, and this line. This black dash line is a uh, prediction accuracy of GBLOB, conventional GBLOB, where we only have genotype and phenotype. So this is a benchmark. So we can see uh, with less and less omics data in the middle, the prediction accuracy will be close, decrease, and then close to the conventional uh, genomic prediction where we only have genotype and phenotype data. So, um, then how then when we have 100% missing, let's say no omics data, in the, in this 
situation NMM will be equivalent to the uh, conventional mixed model. So in this situation, we only have genotypes, phenotypes, everything in the middle are missing. And if we have, if we, if the G is identity, then this, the, then this is a prediction accuracy of NMM versus a conventional mixed model, G bluff. So they are uh, identical. And also, uh, as I mentioned, here, here we allow the nonlinear function G um, between the middle layer and the output layer. And here we, um, here just one example, when using a linear activation function has, uh, is, uh, is worse than using a nonlinear activation function. So here is also the prediction accuracy. And also, uh, we are using mixed models to model those unknowns. For, uh, for example, the marker effects on all mix or the all mix effects on phenotypes. And we can allow users to set different priors. For example, priors from base C, priors from G blob in a in a in a, in a mixed model. So here is uh, one 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 result when using price from base C is better than using price from G bar. Okay, and now you may ask, um, that what, what if we have some residual genetic effects? So that, it, that is directly from genotypes to phenotypes and not mediated by omics. So uh, in NMM, this can be uh, included by adding extra uh, hidden nodes in the mix in the middle layer. For example, this red part uh, can include the can can account for the, the residual genetic effects directly from genotype to phenotype. Okay, and also NMM can be very fast with parallel computing. Um, for, uh, for for example, here we have. Uh, when we sample the unknowns between input and middle layer, we have in this in this figure we have three uh, single traits mixed model. So we can use let's say we can use three computer processors to to run these three models at the same time. Uh, and also, so we have implemented NMM into our open source software called JWAS. So, uh, we, so the, the user, inter, the interface for user is quite easy. We just read the data, build the model using one lines of code, then run the, then, uh, then run, run the analysis. And in our software, we even implement the partial connected network. So for example, the users like you, you can assign like these three SNPs. They connect to the, let's say connect to first omics and these two SNPs, they can only connect to the second omics. So this kind of partial connecting network and the structure is defined by the users. Um, so now uh, please find more details in the documentation of uh, our software JWAS. Okay, now let me briefly summarize some advantages of NMM. First, NMM allows heterogeneous input data across multiple layers. Um, for example, this is the genotypes in the first layer, and in the middle layer is all mix, right? But for all the other uh, general purpose, much. Uh, deep learning softwares, for example, PyTorch or TensorFlow, they only allow users to put everything in the input layer. For example, you put genotype here and you put omics here. Mm. And the second advantage is it's based on mixed models. And the mixed model has been um, successfully used in for many years and we hope the success can continue here. And also uh, NMM. Now, um, now NMM is based on, on 
is under kind of Bayesian framework. So we can provide statistical uncertainty or significance measures for association study. And also we need little tuning, unlike other, um, so for other machine learning or deep learning softwares, so they first they only provide you the point estimate of the unknowns. For example, they they can um, they can estimate like the weight the weight of this marker on this omics is 0.9, but but without the p value, without the statistical uncertainty, we cannot do association studies. And also for other softwares, um, they they need many tunings for hyperparameters. Um, but uh, in Bayesian, we will sample those unknowns. So we oh, so we only need very little tuning. And uh, currently, we are speeding up the NMM uh, in both uh, in both algorithm and also the hardware. For the algorithm, we are um, we are developing a more scalable algorithm. So NMM can be applied to a very large data sets. And for hardware, we are uh, you testing the GPU computing. And also in the future, we plan to add at least one more layers in NMM. So now we have two middle layers. For example, we can have genotypes to the, uh, let's say, gene expression, then to the protein expression, right? Uh, okay, so here, uh, here, here is another example of NMM. So actually, you can see NMM, this three layer structure can be perfectly fitted for the single step scenarios. And the single, and we all, um, uh, I believe some of you may heard, heard the single step scenario because this is quite important, especially in animal breeding. In animal breeding, usually we have a very large pedigree like this one. But only part of the in, a subset of the, the individuals in the pedigree are genotypes, have the genotype information, and other individuals, they do not, they are not genotyped. And in this situation, the single step is um, kind of very important. Uh, and, NM, and here I just want to demonstrate NMM is a perfect representation for single step. So all we need, so when we put the pedigree in the input layer and the genotypes in the second layer and phenotypes in the third layer. So we can see here uh, if the individuals is genotyped, let's say a, a recent new individual with genotypes, then in the middle layer we have is genotypes, let's say 22011. But if individual is not genotyped, so then in the, in the middle layer we just put all missing values here and we will we're going to sample the missing values based on both pedigree and phenotype. Uh, so, and so now let, let's summarize NMM. So here we propose this three layer structure, NMM, your network with mixed models. And when we have genotypes, all mix and the phenotypes, this kind of structure, we, we can call it all mix NMM. And for the single step scenario, we can put we can put pedigree, genotypes, and phenotypes for the single step scenario. And all and we have uh, and we have published uh, some papers in in for both NMM structure and uh, all mix and also the single step. The single step NMM has been published uh, just just in last month. Okay, so here are the reference. Uh, okay, so now, so now you see, uh, when you see, uh, actually the conventional mixed model cannot handle the three-layer structure uh, together. So we can propose the NMM, and uh, here is another example that the conventional uh, mixed model cannot be handled. So we need to propose some new models to solve the challenges. So here uh, in this project, we study the functional conservation between human and pig. And pig is very important for human studies uh, and also 
Um, what uh, currently, so uh, what we are familiar is, so let's say I have a DNA segment from pig, and I also have a DNA segment from human, those ATGC, ATGC. So we can compare those ATGC to see whether these two, they are sim they are they are identical. So this is called um, sequence level conservation. So, but nowadays we have some new data, let's say functional data of the genome. We have, uh, for example, in human, uh, we have many functional data from the ENCODE project, roadmap, epigenomics project, and for PIG, we have some functional data from the farm projects. So those new data bring new challenges for us. So how to integrate those data such that we know these two pairs, to, wait, to what extent they are similar in a functional level. So before we know they are to, to, what, uh, to what extent they are similar in sequence level, ATGC, ATGC, but now to what extent they are similar in functional, in functional level. Okay, so here we propose this model to answer this question. So let's say I have um, one pair of human region, peak region, and I can extract the functional features uh, using those new data for this region, human region, and also I have some functional features for these peak regions. So for the human regions, so those those functional features are inputs here, and for peak, uh, those functional features that that the inputs of the neural network here, and here why? So in in this in this uh, neural network, X is the functional feature. So this is a human specific uh, network. This is a peak specific network, and here y is the now is now the y is zero and one. Zero means these two uh, these two regions they are likely to have similar function, and zero means these two regions they are unlikely to have similar regions. And when we train the model, so we we actually. We, are, we actually transfer the 0, 1, the binary, into a score between 0 and 1. And that score, we call it um, the score for the functional conservation between uh, human and pig. And in our, uh, in our uh, neural network, we have uh, about 400 functional features for both human and pig. And, uh, and here we use the alignment um, to represent whether they are likely to have uh, similar function or or dissimilar functions. Uh, and here, uh, I just want to show you very preliminary result, uh, some uh, some results of the scores. Uh, here we use this many of alignments between human and pig, which cover 45% uh, of the human genome. And we can see for those um, for those regions, most of the regions have a pretty low score, which means those regions uh, they are unlikely to have similar functions um, between human and pig. But we do have some regions with a very high score. Uh, and now, and this paper has been published, uh, and like two months ago. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and we also have many results to validate that our score is actually uh, informative. Uh, we have many figures and many downstream analysis. And for more details, please refer to our uh, publications. OK, and and here, here I want to explain again why the conventional mixed model cannot handle this situation. So this is because you can see in this structure we have a let's say human specific network and pig specific network. We uh, and uh, and we need the order. So which means we we need the order of the functional features. But for the conventional mixed model, let's say y equals x1 plus x2 plus x3, actually those orders of those features x1, x2, x3 doesn't matter. But, but but here we do need a human specific, peak specific, so the order matters. So that's why the conventional 
model, conventional mixed model cannot handle this, uh, these new challenges. Okay, um, so now uh, let's go to um, the second part of my research, the large data. Um, we, so here I, I, I will go through this part quickly. Um, so this part, we propose the fast parallel sampling of Bayesian regression models for genomic prediction. So this is a very typical um, Bayesian regression models. Oh, so this is a simplified one. We have Y, we have overall mean, we have genotype X, we have marker effects alpha and the residuals E. And, the, and in, in, in Bayesian linear mix model for the alpha, we have different priors. For example, the priors from GBLOB, the price from base A, the mixture price from base B, base C, and all the price from Bayesian lasso. Uh, and here is a demonstration, just a simple demonstration of the MCMC sampling of the marker effects. Uh, so at each, so when, so that, so at th that's actually how we estimate the unknowns, the, the marker effects in Bayesian linear mix model. So we use something called Gibbs sampling and at each iter MCMC iteration. So first we sample the alpha one, so which is the marker effect of the first marker, given all the latest value of all the other marker effects. So this is called full conditional posterior distribution of alpha one. And then we sample alpha two, given the latest value of all the other markers. So so here, this alpha one should be used here. And then we sample alpha three because we, because it requires the uh, the most recent value. So these two values should be used here. So we can see here if we have so if if we have many markers, let's say fifty thousand, and and we have many many MCMC iteration, let's say there's also fifty thousand. Then the computation is very intensive because we can. We cannot sample alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Those alphas at the, at the same time simultaneously. We can. What we can do is we can sample alpha one, then we sample alpha two, then we sample alpha three. They are dependent. And here is uh, is uh, here is just some equations to show that why they are dependent. So as I mentioned before, we sample alpha from their Full conditional posterior distributions, and and alpha is the solution to this equation. Actually, this equation is the um, is a mixed model equation, and and you can see here in the uh, right hand side we have x j transpose x j is the j's column in the x x j transpose times this part. This part we have x j. Um, prime here x j prime not is not equal to j so so we can see here um, because we need to use x this 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 red part makes the uh, makes this distribution dependent for each other so this is the um, another explanation in terms of the from the mass from the uh, equation so what if this red part equals zero so if xj transpose times this part is zero, then the dependence is gone, right? So what we did is, uh, so in the right side is our new, the new method. We add some new data here. Uh, so here our 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 old our original data is let's say one and x. We add new data, so let's say j tilde, x tilde, such that this new data makes our new incidence matrix orthogonal to each other. So which means each column times, um, so which means this uh, matrix times the transpose of this matrix is an identity matrix. So each columns they are orthogonal to each other. The, the dot product is zero. So because these parts, because these columns are orthogonal, so you can see if if they are orthogonal, then x j transpose x j prime, the j's column in the new data times other columns in the new data is zero because it's orthogonal. So this part is gone. 
this part is gone, then the full conditional posterior distribution of alpha j uh, does not rely on all, all the other mark effects. So because they are dependent, then in each MCMC iteration, we can sample all the mark effects at the same time. So we design the parallel computing uh, uh, code where we split the whole genome into different groups. For each group, we assign uh, computer processors to estimate the markers, um, mark marker effects. And uh, um, and for uh, so here, ideally, ideally, let's say we have k markers. Ideally, we if we have also have k computers, then the k computers can run at the same time. So the MCMC can be accelerated by k times, where k is the number of computer process, up to p times, where p is the number of markers. And uh, we tested on a middle uh, middle density marker panel with 50,000 marker, 50,000 individuals. And our and we use 24 nodes with 24 CPUs on on, on each node, computer nodes. And uh, our algorithm is 170 times faster than the conventional conventional uh, MCMC. But however, uh, you can see here we introduce we also introduce another unknown. Y tilde, and uh, at each iteration we we are going to sample the y tilde, and this will affect the convergence, and uh, this makes our algorithm um, seventy times uh, more iterations to obtain the same prediction accuracy. So overall, we have uh, well we are ten times faster than the conventional sampler. So here is a summary of our uh, a new new algorithms. Um, we add data. Uh, we augment new data here to make the columns orthogonal, such that the posterior, uh, the full conditional distribution of marker effects are in, are independent. So we can sample them in a, in, in parallel. And this paper has been published um, in in GSE. Okay, so here this is the uh, last part uh, of my research is the sharing data, the homomorphic encryption for genotypes and phenotypes (HEGP) for shared genome to phenome analysis. So. So we know the data sharing is kind of very important in academia. For example, when you submit papers in submit manuscript in genetics, it requires all the data must be publicly available. And also, um, uh, two year, uh, one one year ago, the funding agencies have this requirement that all publications that uh, resulting from federal funded federal funded projects should should publish their data immediately. OK, so we can see it's very important to uh, follow the FAIR principles for the data sharing in academia. FAIR means findable, accessible, interpretable and re reusable. And also, data sharing uh, can also be very important for for private industry. This is because if we can share the data, we can we can do the joint analysis using using a much large, much bigger data size. And this joint analysis can um, can help us to have a more powerful. Um, discoveries, but we know that the data sharing is important. But due to many many concerns, the privacy, the policy, the IP concerns, it's very hard to share the data. For example, oh no no um so so, so here we propose we try to solve this um, problem by proposing a. Uh, um, 
a HGP method. So, so we want to uh, encrypt the data, encrypt the genotype and the phenotype, such that the confidential information is gone, is uh, is obscured. But we allow further validation and research using only the encrypted data. And we can obtain the same results using the encrypted data and the key as using the raw data. And uh, uh, here is uh, the, just one example to show what is homomorphic encryption. So let's say, let's say you are the data owner, you have some data and I'm your data analyst. First, you encrypt the data in your own computer. So you have this encrypted data. And then you send your encrypted data to me, to data analyst, and I will analyze, analyze the data to have encrypted output. Then I will send the encrypted output, output to you, and then you can decrypt the data, decrypt the output. And so this is called in this in uh, in in our example, the data is genotypes, phenotypes, and the output is the estimated genetic values. So now I'm going to show you how does HEGP work, homomorphic encryption for genotype and phenotype. So here is the raw data, the raw genotype, the raw phenotype for four individuals and sex. SNPs. So first, we are going to uh, generate a randomly a th random orthogonal matrix P, and uh, P X. This is X, and the P X is the uh, encrypted genotypes. This is Y, and the P times Y is the encrypted phenotypes. So th that's how we encrypt the genotypes and phenotypes. And only the encrypted data. The encrypted genotypes and encrypted phenotypes will be shared, and the p and the key p is not will not be shared. Okay, so how does the encrypted genotype look like? You can see in the left this is a raw data. Um, this is a genotype matrix. We have n by p. We and for those genotypes it's coded as zero one two. So we only have three colors. And if I extract one column here, and you can see here is a histogram. We have some zero, some one, some twos. And this is the encrypted one. So this is the encrypted genotype matrix. It's N by P. We have some individuals and genotypes. And if we extract one column and to look at the values, the electric continuous numbers follows a, a normal distribution, like a bell shape. And also here is a very important properties of HEGP. So in the left is the LD matrix. So LD matrix uh, is the relationship between SNPs. So let's say I have P SNPs. Then this LD is a P by P uh, relationship matrix. So this is the LD matrix uh, calculated using the raw data. This is the LD matrix calculated using the encrypted data. So we can see actually these two LD matrix, they are identical. So here the conclusion is the HEGP preserve the relationship between SNPs. It's unchanged. But now let's look at the relationship between individuals. So let's see, this is a, uh, this is a genomic relationship matrix, which is a which is a relationship between uh, individuals. If we have n individuals, then this is the n by n matrix. This is the genomic relationship matrix calculated using the raw data. This is the genomic relationship matrix calculated using the encrypted data. So we can see in the raw data there are some structures, but in the encrypted data all the structures they are gone. So the conclusion here is the HEGP destroyed, scrambles the relationship between individuals. OK, so here in our data analysis, um, we use some peak data from this paper we there, where there are 3,000 individuals, 50,000 um, markers. 
and uh, we have simulated phenotypes uh, under different genetic architectures uh, with different heritability and different percentage of QTLs in the markers. And also we add some um, group fi fixed effects, for example, the group effects, and uh, we uh, have 10 replicates. Here we use the, here I, I will only show you the results from BSC Pi, which is a Bayesian uh, linear mix model uh, with mixture priors. Uh, and, the, uh, and the same conclusion can be made for, uh, for all the other uh, methods. So we can see here with different uh, heritability and uh, different uh, QDR percentage, using the encrypted data, encrypted data generates the same estimated breeding values as using the raw data. And here, another uh, result using the encrypted data, we estimate almost identical um, estimated marker effects uh, using the encrypted data or using the raw data. And here is another uh, results. Here we split the whole genome into different windows. And for each window, we can calculate the local, the window genetic variance. So this can be used for association studies. Uh, here, here is the um, local genetic variance calculated using the encrypted data. This is the local genetic variance calculated using the raw data. So you can see they are almost identical. And now, um, this uh, here I want to briefly demonstrate why this works. Like why, why the p matrix, the random orthogonal matrix, can be used to for encryption. So this is because uh, um, p um, this after encryption, the genotype becomes p x. Okay, the the px transpose times px equals x transpose times p transpose then times px because p is orthogonal so this part in the middle is gone so we only have x transpose x so similar so we can see using the encrypted data or using the raw data they will have same x transpose x and x transpose y and for example if you if you um, if you think about the normal equation, the normal equation is something we used to solve the uh, linear regression. So the no in normal equation, the um, the slope is calculated is estimated as um, from this one x transpose x inverse times x transpose y. So we can see actually the x and y they are not used individually like we are not only using x or only using y we are using x transpose x and x transpose y so as long as these two parts are unchanged then you will have the same solutions here so this just this just a uh, equation from the normal equation but for actually you will see for the mixed models uh, they have similar uh, the the ideas are the same because x transpose x and x transpose y they are unchanged so the all the estimations are also unchanged and also as i mentioned before we can do joint analysis using the encrypted data so let's say this is a company one i have some genotypes phenotypes and this is company two they have genotypes phenotypes so they will first encrypt their data in their own computers. So company one have encrypted genotype, encrypted phenotype, and company two, they will only have their own encrypted genotype, encrypted phenotype. Then they can share the encrypted data. And uh, such that we can use the joint, uh, joint encrypted data for joint analysis. Okay, uh, so here we have uh, so in our pro in our publications, uh, this paper has been accepted by Genetics, um, and it will be published very soon. So in our paper, we have pro uh, we have proved 
This method works for GBLOB, RBLOB, Bayesian alphabets, uh, which is the Bayesian linear regression models, and also, um, and uh, it's quite straightforward that this method also work for multi-trade and also single step scenario. Um, and in the future, we will investigate the application on categorical trades with threshold model and also on neural networks. So here, um, I have finished my um, 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 talk in my research, and now let me summarize this one. So um, for my research, we propose the neural network with mixed models NMM to include intermediate all mixed data into conventional genomic prediction. And also this is uh, uh, another representation for a single step scenario. And also we propose deep learning uh, models for human peak cross species on <coughs> analysis. And, and this is because uh, and this is because the conventional mixed model cannot handle these two challenges, this this new data. And also, uh, I'm interested in computation in some in in the parallel computing. And also, this is the more applied challenge of data sharing. And uh, uh, I'm also uh, one of the developer of the open source software JWAS. So this is for the uh, whole genome analysis uh, using a Julia language, and maybe some of you may um, may even heard of this software. And every time when we have new models, we will implement the new models into our own software so we can test it. Uh, here are some references, and I want to thank my collaborators at UC Davis, Hao Chen, and at Iowa State, uh, Rohan, Fernando, Jack Dakers, and also from University of Queensland, Jen Zhen, and uh, uh, from Messi University, Doran, Garrick, and from Aarhus University, Lin Zhao Fan, and also from UCL, uh, Richard Mott. Um, um, and, and as I'm, uh, I, I do want to mention again, my lab is hiring and uh, for fully funded, fully funded PhD student positions. And if you are interested in those, uh, those projects, I, I just presented those um, statistical and quantitative genetics projects, then please uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Okay, I think I'm done. And you? Um, okay. Hey, thank you, Dr. Zhao. Um, we will now open the floor for anyone that has any questions. So feel free if you have any questions, you can raise your hands and turn on your microphone. Um, or if you prefer, um, you can enter your question into the chat as well. And I can read it out loud if you prefer. Thank you. I'm not familiar with Tim. Oh, here. <laughs> any questions? Any questions? Um, Flavio, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Ch changing. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Thank you so much for your excellent uh, presentation. Really, <laughs> really cool stuff that you presented. Thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure to present here. Yeah. So uh, I have a, just a, um, a question for you. In the the results that you presented with the simulation. Uh -huh. uh, which uh, the simulation results. Oh, uh, you mean this one? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so um, okay. for for the uh, omics information that you had in the simulation. Uh -huh. So let's say if it was uh, gene expression, right? So just put in. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, you can. So uh, uh -huh. how um, how informative was was the omics information there? Uh, in your uh, simulation, how informative was the omics with respect to the phenotypes? Oh, and so so first I want to uh, describe how we simulate. Uh, not yeah. how we how they, how they simulate the data uh, in their um, in their paper. So in 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 the simulation, 
um, for, uh, so first all mix. So we first uh, uh, simulate the all mix uh, like um, based on the genotypes, and then we simulate the 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 trait. Let's say the y based on all mix. So in our simulation, the assumption is already the genotypes affect the all mix, and then the all mix fit. Uh, affect the phenotype. So this is our assumption. And so that's why you can see under this assumption, if we have less and less omics data, then the accuracy will be going, uh, yeah. will be decreased. Yes, that, that's what uh, uh, I like it more, uh, more explanation, right? To how it was simulated. Because in practice, if, if you are going to use the, any omics information, that omics are going to have a certain uh, accuracy or, or a certain uh, amount of information with respect to the association with the phenotype. So you you might not gain as much as in your simulation, right? Yes, yes, I I agree. Actually, th this simulation is a kind of a perfect simulation yeah, for exactly exactly <laughs> for for our model because uh, um but um. Because here we here in a simulation genotype affect all mix, then all mix affect the phenotype. But in 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 in, in reality, uh, it's very hard to have exactly same scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, but here, but here, our our uh, we believe that if because the the biology is very complex, the relationship between genotypes, all mix, and phenotypes, and our assumption is that if you believe if you believe the uh, if you believe this, this multi-layer regulation network underlying, uh, underlying your data, like if you believe in your data, the genotypes, genotypes affect some intermediate omics, then the intermediate omics affect the phenotype. Then I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile to at least try our model to, to see whether this can, this can be helpful. Uh, actually, we have tried this our model on on maize data. We have the genotypes and the uh, is is uh, and all mixed data is actually microbiome in the root of the maize and also the phenotype. And we did see some improvements of the prediction accuracy. Okay. Yeah. No. Uh, no. I, I think it's, it's a great model. Like it makes complete sense. I was just uh, I like to make sure that I understood <laughs> well the simulation, those uh, big gains, right? Because there is yeah. basically no uh, error there. It, it's just uh, the way that it simulated the, the input layer yeah. and the output. They, no, they have a. Uh, they are all connected without um, error, right? Uh, level of, of. They are very informative. Let's say what you use. <laughs> Okay, mm. thank you so much for the clarification and thanks for presenting. Thank you. Thanks for your question. And if you have time, I could ask one more quick question if you have time. Um, so if you're NNMM, are you you're predicting phenotypes here and rather than breeding values? Oh, I this uh, this is actually a uh, very practical question because in our simulation we know the true breeding values, right? So yeah. we can always when we calculate the prediction accuracy, we can always use the correlation between the estimated breeding value and the true breeding value. But in reality, uh, in, uh, in reality, what we have is the uh, phenotypes data. So, um, so, so in so so in reality, you you, you can also use. We can only use the uh, estimated breeding value. Uh, uh, we can use we can calculate the cor uh, accuracy as the correlation between estimated breeding value and the true phenotype. Uh, so this is kind of genomic prediction, but but actually in our model it depends on how you. We, uh, in our model we can uh, we can we can both calculate estimated breeding value and or the estimated phenotypes. So for example, if we want to calculate the estimated breeding value, so the estimated breeding value will be X uh, for the testing individuals will be X times the X of the testing individuals times W0. 
then times w1 it's because x times w0 is the is the breeding is the estimate uh, is the breeding value of omics and then the breeding value of omics times the w1 is is kind of the overall breeding values so this is the estimated breeding values calculated in our model but we can also do phenotypic prediction in phenotypic pre prediction here we do not use x times w zero w one we can di directly use this is z z times w one because because here we are using both ge ge genetics part and uh, uh, non genetic part of of the omics z times w one this can be used for phenotypic prediction and uh, yeah and it yeah and we yeah and this is kind of two ways of cal uh, yeah. or calculating those values yeah okay okay that's very cool very cool thank you um yeah and i if there's no other questions i think we're pretty close to well, i guess we're over time here so thank you dr zhao um for the really great presentation today it was very interesting and yeah very novel um thank and thank you everyone that joined us today so oh, see you all you. next week Please. and have a nice weekend bye you recruit students bye <laughs>